So this work represents um, the contribution of many, many people at Google. Um, so in this paper, we talk about how we manage the Google's TPU supercomputers. Um, as many of you probably know, we build our own chips and supercomputer clusters to accelerate our machine learning computation graphs. So um, this diagram here shows one example, uh, HLO graph, the computation graph we process uh, for Google. It doesn't represent any real workload, but it kind of gives you a good idea of uh, what kind of workloads we handle. Um, so if you look at that, that represents uh, many conventional data flow graphs. And in fact, at Google, we built systems to uh, accelerate these data flow graphs. Like for instance, you can imagine every node is um, labeling a new store in Google Maps, et cetera. Uh, the reason we need to build a new chips and a new supercomputer for that is because these computation graphs or these workloads are very regular. They resemble the conventional HPC applications, uh, a lot of MATMOL operations, very regular data access patterns, and they scale to a lot of uh, a lot of data. So you can scale to a large amount of training data, and the model can be very large in today's LLMs. So so we build chips for that, and you know having a fast iteration of these models it exposes immense product opportunities. Um, like Facebook's, uh, like the Facebook uh, paper has mentioned, recommendation models and generative AI models recently. So we want to explore these things as fast as possible. Uh, so this diagram is a, uh, shows a very high level of what the TPU compose of. Uh, we published a paper on the hardware architecture in ISCA last year. Uh, we have a tensor core that processes uh, MATMOS, dense matrix multiplication, a sparse core that handles uh, basically uh, sparsity embeddings, uh, sparse matrix operations, a chip manager, which is an ARM core on the chip that functions almost like an operating system of the accelerator, and the CPU would just, would just send work to the, to the TPU over PCI, and the TPU would just uh, do the work, send the result back to the CPU. So that's the model of operation. Um, these TPUs, they are tightly coupled. Uh, we have a back on the side network. Uh, that's in contrast to the conventional CPU, CPU clusters. So they're tightly tight coupled in the sense that they run MPI style of computation. So everything works in log span. That you have a lot of collectives working along, working, working in the process. So in this paper, um, we're going to primarily talk about the ICI part of the TPU supercomputer. That's the interconnect. So on every chip, uh, on every TPU chip, there is a module we call that ICI switch. So you can think of that. We build our own um, switch chip module, a mini switch chip module inside every chip. And the chip talks to a fast interconnect. Uh, we call that interchip interconnect ICIs. That's you know that's our version of Rocky V2 or NVLink. Um, so there's a lot of benefit why we build it this way. Um, the IC with ICIs, the TPUs can RDMA to each other directly. We can bypass NICs. Uh, we can bypass CPUs. Uh, and then we're not bottlenecked by the NIC bandwidth or the um, or the data center networking bandwidth. And our ICS per chip has very, very large uh, bandwidth. So on V4, on, if you ran a cloud TPU VM on V4, that's 2,400 gigabits per second unidirectionally. Uh, on V5, we double that. And we can scale a TPU cluster to thousands of chips, uh, 4K chips, 8K chips, and we can stack multiple TPU clusters to train uh, our Gemini models, for instance. And we build these ICS basically to accelerate the collective ops, all gather, reduce, scatter, all reduce. So anyone training machine learning models are not uh, are pretty familiar with these things. Now, as we build ICS, these networks, and as we scale them to large scale, we're going to inherit all the uh, conventional HPC uh, communities' reliability at scale problem. And these problems are not new. Uh, so we talk about how we address them uh, with the TPU approach. So on this slide, you can, it shows the problem we face at Google. So you have user keep submitting jobs. These jobs have uh, different scales. Some have 10 chips. You know, user, user, uh, researchers are just experimenting new model architectures. Um, some have hundreds of chips. Uh, for instance, you train embedding models uh, for ads recommendation. And sometimes you train with thousands or tens of thousands of chips uh, for foundational AI models. Uh, you, you submit all these jobs to the to the supercomputer, and the supercomputer will have faults all the time. It will have faults at the chip level, link level, on the TPU, on the CPU, data center network, ICIs. All kinds of things can happen. Um, but in the idea world, we would want the user, uh, the model researcher, to be um, to to not know about these uh, faults at all. The jobs can just keep submitting. They don't have to wait all the time, and they don't have to worry about well, my job getting interrupted. Uh, what happened, etc. So that's uh, that's what this uh, what the system we built about. Um, so before we dive into the software uh, workflow, uh, here's a picture of the TPU v4, uh, the board we deploy in in Google's data centers. Uh, there are four chips per board, and on the left side of this chart, you can see um, there are some ports. That's where the interconnects gets plugged into the board, 
And this is one eighth of a supercomputer we deploy. Uh, each supercomputer you will see eight rows, and this is one row. One row have eight racks. Um, you can see the yellow, yellow cables. These are the interconnect cables. Uh, they get routed top of the rack and then goes to the circuit switches. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a kind of a context of why we build these things, how these things function. Uh, the next, we're going to talk about the network architecture specifically for our supercomputer. So we designed the ICIs to have a Taurus network architecture because we wanted to match the application's characteristics. We think of um, ML training to have uh, three independent parallelism. Uh, you can divide the tensors, the, uh, basically the weight tensors. You can divide the input data in the batch dimension. You can divide the models uh, vertically along different pipeline stages. And these are independent. So we build a Taurus architecture of the network. And you can map these parallelism to each dimension in a very efficient way. And the Taurus network is very bandwidth efficient, uh, cost efficient. Um, and when we factor in all the cost of cables, switches, um, everything together. It, so it just saves us a lot of dollars. Um, and more importantly, we, we don't want this network to be shared at all. So we don't want to have uh, contending flows. Um, so TPU can talk to each other with very predictable uh, performance. And that's critical for us to compile our models so we can anticipate the time spent in computer and communication. We can overlap these things with uh, precise prediction, for instance. So uh, historically, we built 2D Taurus models. That's what we ship in V2 and V3. In V2, it's a smaller, smaller status supercomputer. Uh, each supercomputer only have 256 chips. In V3, we scale it up. Each supercomputer has 1,000 chips. Uh, we ship a special version of V3. We, we concat concatenate four parts of V3. And so that pro provides more flops. And that's, that's one year of uh, ML Perv, I believe. Um, so these are 2D models. They are static. We, it means we deploy one model, uh, one, one supercomputer, and that stays there as it is. So these will have all kinds of problems. You, know, you have chip faults, you have host faults, you have uh, small jobs taking up some part, part of the supercomputer. And there will be resource fragmentation everywhere. So when, you have, when, when, uh, you know, when we have larger business needs, we want more chips to, to be used for training. Um, sometimes the job will stay pending for a lot of time. So that has a problem. Um, in V4, in our, our approach is to leverage uh, circuit switches. So we publish a lot of papers on the in, in SCI about how we use circuit switches for our data center networking, and we use that for TPUs, uh, the, our accelerator supercomputer as well. So the way it works is like this. So we have uh, we group 64 TPUs into a 3D cube, a 4 by 4 by 4 cube. So that's uh, in physical world that's one rack, and each supercomputer would have 64 of these racks. So each supercomputer would have 64 of these 4x4x4 four by four by four cubes. So you can think of this as a building block of a TPU supercomputer. And these 64 cubes, they're cross-connected to each other over a set of optical circuit switches. So uh, over these circuit switches, any cube can be connected to any other cube form arbitrary shapes. And these arbitrary shapes can serve any user job. So that's how it works. Um, uh, a more intuitive example is with this animation. So suppose I'm a user, I want just eight TPUs, and you can arrange that in a two by two by two, a 3D mesh. That's smaller than the cube. You know, we give it to one cube, that's say user A. And then you have a user B that says, I want a 128 TPUs. Maybe, you know, we're training an embedding model. And we can select any four cubes out, out of this 64 cube pool. They don't have to be adjacent. They can be anywhere. And we can just use circuit switch to con connect them together. Uh, the next next time, well, faults occur somewhere in the in the in, in this in this part. That's okay because um, the cubes doesn't have to be adjacent to each other as long as the circuits which can connect them. Uh, that doesn't hurt uh, the running jobs. And then you know, suppose we have another job uh, that says I want twenty two thousand TPUs. Well, I want to train a foundation model. We just you know select any of the remaining cubes that that satisfy this two number two thousand forty eight, uh, and the circuit switch can take the job. We can connect them together and. The user, job is, the user job C is still going to function pretty well. Now, if you have another job, user job that says, I want a 2 by 2 by 4 it's a still a sub-cube job. You can co-locate co them with uh, the cube allocated to user A. Um, and it doesn't hurt the uh, running jobs of B, C, these mid and uh, large scale jobs. So that's the theory of operation um, with this circuit switch to reconfigurability. Um, to make it work, um, we have a large set of software services uh, running behind the knees. Uh, so before I dive into the software services, it would be useful to look at the networking protocol we, we, we use for Google's TPUs. Uh, we have um, 
a dedicated specialized protocol for ICIs. Uh, we don't use Rocky or uh, any other protocols. Uh, we want this protocol to be very simple uh, for cost effectiveness reasons. Uh, it's a layered protocol and it enables circuit switching and packet switching at the same time. Uh, it makes sure our jobs are mutually exclusive so we have predictable performance and you know, every layer of this, protocol, of this protocol is software programmable. So you can look from the, from the right side. On the right side, that's the physical layer. Uh, the physical layer that's coding serializer, deserializer, and talks to the ICI link medium. And the link medium has very high bandwidth. We make sure in the physical layer, that's where the OCS, the circuit switch, can cross-connect different cubes. So every ICI port can connect to every other ICI port over the circuit switch, and the two ICI ports can auto-lock with each other at the physical layer. And this is controlled by a, by a service called Pod Manager. And to the data layer and the routing layer, we program these routing tables and these buffers in the, in, in, in the ICS switch. So that determines how a uh, packet goes from A to B, which path it traverses, uh, fault tolerance, um, advanced topologies like twisted torus give us uh, higher R2 throughput. Uh, it's controlled by a software service called libtpu.so. So if you rent a cloud TPU VM, and you, in, if you in, uh, and you install Jax or PyTorch in that VM, the libtpu.so will automatically install there. So that's how it makes work. It's kind of like the CUDA in the NVIDIA's world. Um, and finally, at the transaction layer, you would have a compiler that's just generating RDMA instructions. Uh, it will say, I want to fetch data from this range of HPM and write to the other part of the HPM in another chip. And at the transaction layer, it doesn't need to be aware of how packets are routed underneath and um, how buffers are allocated for each chip. Um, so with this protocol, we can software program the ICS and make sure it's fault tolerant. It fully leverages the configurability of our TPU supercomputer architectures. Um, so here's an animation that helps you understand. So we start with uh, the hardware on the left side. So we have a lot of circuit switches. We have a lot of cubes. The circuit switch represents the networking world and cubes represent the computing world. And they talk to each other over ICI link mediums. And we have a network model, so all, all our models, uh, networking networks are intent driven. Uh, it was published in NSCI 2020. Uh, so this network drives the scheduler and the pod manager. The Borg scheduler, it's, uh, it's very famous. It's published in Eurosys a long, long time ago. And all the scheduler and the pod manager subscribe this, pod mo uh, this networking model. So now suppose you have a user job that comes in. The user job says, hey, I want to use this many TPUs. Uh, Borg, the scheduler, can you find me those? The Borg will consult the network model uh, and, of course, the existing usage scenario, uh, the utilization of the fleet, and says, okay, we're going to find these, uh, I don't know, three cubes or whatever for you. And we'll publish those, uh, those resource utilization requests. And the pod net manager will subscribe to, it, sub subscribe to that. It keeps podding pod Borg and says, okay, now we need these three cubes to be connected in a particular geometric shape, and then sends our PC requests to the OCS devices. And each Oracle OCS circuit device will then um, translate that request into very detailed port-to-port -port cross connect action actions, and then the cubes will be cross connected in the way the user wants. And then after after that's done, we're going to send an approv approval signal to the scheduler. The scheduler will know, okay, these cubes are ready. We're ready to run the job. We allocate the job binaries to these cubes, and you're ready to run. So before we run, we actually run uh, before we run the actual job. We have another we call pre-flight, a health pre-flight, because at massive scale, faults can occur any, anywhere. So before we actually run the job, we run a small pre-flight that makes sure the physical layer of the links are all okay. Um, the cheap chips can run some very simple uh, applications, so all the hardware is okay. Once that's fine, we have full confidence um, these resources are okay. And then we start you know, setting up this network. We do network topology discovery, uh, setting up the addressing of each TPU, uh, program the routing tables, so uh, the program will have a consistent view of um, the slice, the, 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 the network resource underneath. And then you have the compiler comes into the picture. So the compiler compiles, again, this networking abstraction. It generates our DMA instructions to fulfill the collective algorithm, like all reduce, reduce, scatter, and it partitions the model, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, after that your job can run. Um, at times during in flight, during the job, during the job execution, you will see faults here and there. Um, that happens. Anyone who plays with foundation models have seen that. Uh, in that case, the daemon, the health D, will catch that. It will tell 
a separate repel system that says, we need to repel this hardware resource, and meanwhile, we have to interrupt any running job on that machine. And the job will get evicted, it will get rescheduled. Uh, it can reschedule landing in a fault tolerant degraded mode or a normal mode, depending on what the, whether the user job uh, accept that or not. So at a high level, this is how everything works together. Uh, with these big pictures, uh, we can scale the, um, the supercomputer to about 94% availability at around 3K TPUs. Uh, that's pretty good. So the user job doesn't need to wait for a long time before their job starts running. But we want to do a little bit better. So to, do, to, to further boost the availability from 94%, uh, you, we kind of have to look at uh, how we route ICI packets. Um, so here there are a lot of uh, very detailed and advanced routing we do. Um, I'm not going to talk about each one of them. I think the key takeaway is uh, in each job has one addressable domain. Uh, we do flow control at the data, la data layer. Um, and we don't have very advanced congestion control, and we don't need that because we have an exclusive network. The job just owns all the resources it has, and we have very regular traffic patterns, so we don't have to worry about advanced congestion control. And a static routing algorithm would, would suffice to load balance everything. Um, so in the fault-free case, we use dimension order routing. Um, so every node just talks to every other in the torus, goes through X, Y, and Z. Um, this applies to torus and twisted torus as well. Uh, the twisted torus is for uh, a particular scenario where well, it's all too heavy. So in the fault tolerance case, we have a special uh, routing algorithm. We call that wild first hop. Um, so in the first hop, we can go in any direction. And following that, we can go following the conventional dimension order routing. Um, so this allows us to tolerate faults um, at the OCS level. So when we have that capability, we can actually um, boost the availability going from 94% to 97%, uh, oh, sorry, 99, uh, 99.8%. So most of the time, you will see the job will be uh, able to schedule onto these TPUs continuously, and the user job doesn't wait, need to wait for a long time. And um, actually, the fault tolerance scheme we have doesn't have a lot of uh, performance degradation. In some cases, they even have better performance uh, compared to the fault-free case, and that's just because these tolerance networks are very difficult to get through. Um, yeah, so this wraps up my talk. Uh, every, anyone can use these uh, TPU v4 and v5 supercomputers on cloud. And I'm ready to take any questions. Yeah.